All right. So uh, who am I? Quick introduction. I'm Brian Charles, CTO of Datavise, an immersive design studio. Um, whoa, that's interesting. We'll, co we'll come back to that. Um, uh, I've been doing uh, code for since the early 90s, uh, mostly on the web. Um, I've been doing media-driven uh, code for maybe 10 years or so. Um, I'm going to talk about web VR. Uh, this doesn't get a lot of attention. Um, we're not really seeing a lot of mainstream, so-called mainstream VR work, such as it is, being done with the web. Um, so maybe uh, an introduction is in order. Um, fundamentally, it's just a web page that renders VR. Um, it uses WebGL for uh, hardware accelerated graphics to generate the left eye and right eye images. Um, it uses a new um, kind of in graft uh, web VR API for accessing uh, VR hardware for uh, you know the, tracking the orientation of your view and the position of your view and it uses the web audio API for um, positional audio um, these tools are all kind of either standards or on track to become standards um, to be widely supported in in web browsers that people use every day um, so uh, Quickly, before we move on to the good stuff, let me just get some limitations out of the way. Um, I think WebVR kind of gets a little bit of bad rap and it's sort of looked as the kind of younger stepbrother of, of the rest of VR. Um, so there, there is some uh, performance cost on the CPU by using JavaScript and, and the kind of web stack. Um, the graphics APIs are limited to what you can do on mobile. So even if you're running on a fancy, expensive desktop, you still have to use the same kind of um, limited APIs that you could use on, say, a phone, um, which is an interesting um, constraint, and I try to use it creatively to kind of be a good constraint. Um, there's limited graf graphical orient uh, authoring tools, uh, which we do need to work on as a community. Um, you know, right now, I'm, you know, most people are coding things by hand, which is a little bit tricky, but does let you do some cool stuff. Um, and it's not amazing for video. So almost everything you're going to see in WebVR is kind of real-time computer generated, um, which is still pretty cool. Um, allows for some really interesting interactions, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, WebVR provides some really interesting uh, advantages when it comes specifically to distribution. Um, first, it's just delivered as a web page. Um, it can use commodity web servers, so CDN sort of delivery really quickly. Um, this is really important. Uh, no app install is required, no downloads required. Um, I think a lot of for smaller pieces, um, especially with, within like a uh, journalistic uh, kind of outlet, um, audiences are maybe reluctant to go, do, go through a whole install um, so that there's a lot less um, kind of friction in user experience. Um, write once, run air anywhere is great. Um, I've, I've talked to a lot of people who have, you know, they'll develop something for Unity on one platform and they say, okay, I got to export this for iOS for Cardboard now and it's going to take me another two months. Um, this stuff, you build it once, it runs everywhere. And I mean everywhere. It's like, you know, desktop, uh, phones, you know, even Internet Explorer kind of, sort of. Um, it's kind of interesting. Um, we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, streaming content is really cool as well. Um, I think we're getting... You know, we're mostly fed this experience of download this giant thing, it's 500 megabytes, it's two gigabytes, and you know, you go to kind of the install, and it says, all right, come back in 15 minutes, and maybe it'll be installed and ready to go. Um, with When you deliver VR as a web page, you can get at least to your basic VR in one second and kind of stream the assets as you go, um, which is also really interesting because I think we see uh, there's a lot of um, research out there that shows that um, people after, if they don't get a response from a web page within a couple of seconds, they move on very quickly. Um, and also you have the benefit of the browser's built-in security sandbox. So you're not installing any sketchy software on your computer that's going to be harvesting who knows what data from you or kind of messing with things. Um, there's a couple of uh, other distribution as aspects that are not as technical um, that kind of what so-called native VR platforms are subject to. Um, one is the app approval process. Um, this can be rather onerous, um, you know, at, at the very least in terms of time. So if you're going to publish something as an app, right now, almost everything we see in VR has to go through some kind of app store, whether it's, you know, Android, iOS, uh, Oculus, on the gear or desktop. Um, 
those app stores have a, an approval process, which can take days or weeks or longer. Um, they're, they're often in, involving censorship, uh, whether it's, uh, I've seen people who are trying to publish apps that get rejected from an app store because it competes with what that platform wants to do. Uh, I also have seen, and I think maybe somebody will talk about this later, um, uh, con VR content rejected because it's too controversial or doesn't align with kind of the politics of whatever company is running the uh, app store, which is a major problem for, um, you know, sort of accessibility for everyone and for, you know, for journalism and documentary. Um, owning your own data is interesting. Some of these app stores also have very strict data retention policies where uh, if you're uh, getting analytics on what your viewers are doing, um, sometimes the app store has a, a license where they will own that data. Um, so maybe you don't want to give that up, um, either just to either because you want to own the data or because you want to protect your viewers from being spied upon. Um, this is really important. Uh, Ziv kind of hinted at this. Um, Web-based VR is really good for archivability. Um, we see throughout history that proprietary technologies tend to go obsolete, um, whereas standard technologies don't. Uh, a web page, if you view today a web page built in 1995, it looks pretty much exactly the same as it did in 1995. It looks dumb because, you know, and crappy, but it looks, but the fidelity is there. It is the same. Uh, there's tons of amazing work done out there in interactive documentary in, say, Flash, um, but Flash we see as being deprecated. And, you know, you can't run it on any iOS devices. Um, the browsers are starting to throttle it or just outright disable it, um, you know, in, in a few years it's gonna be almost impossible to come by. Um, but if I build something today for WebVR using the standards, um, because it's open, it's much more likely to still exist in 20 years as it does. Won't be as good as the rest of the stuff being published in 20 years, but it will be what I published today. Um, you know, we have to ask ourselves, if you publish something on, say, the Gear VR today, in the version that comes out in five years, will it even still run? Um, that's a risk. Um, finally, on this front, uh, the developer tools are free, both as in beer and as in speech. Um, the, you know, basically just a web browser, a text editor. There's tons and tons of open source code that we can use. Um, works with things like Blender and things like that. Um, so there's, you don't have to pay for like royalties or, you know, paying like, like Unity is off, you know, is available for free. But, you know, if you want to charge for it and get rid of the Unity logo up front, you know, there's all kind of complicated uh, licensing deals that I'm not really, that I find confusing. Uh, I want to talk about the responsive web. So res the responsive web is a term that's kind of um, built into web culture and technology that we hear all the time. Um, typically, what it means is if you build a web page for like a big screen and you shrink down your screen, you show it on a phone, or you narrow down your browser width, that will adapt within one web page. Uh, that's a great principle, but um, I like to expand that principle beyond just screen size. So let's look at some of the other factors that we can be responsive about. Um, of course, there's screen size. There's also, like, what kind of input's available? Um, do you have a mouse? Do you have touch? Um, you know, if you're on a tablet, no, you're not going to have a mouse, probably. Um, if you're on a desktop, you're not going to have touch. Um, and this even extends to whether or not you have some kind of VR headset. Um, so, you know, I'm, uh, if you have a VR headset, WebVR stuff will work great, but if not, we can at least show it to you as kind of a desktop experience or tablet experience as a fallback. Um, GPU and CPU performance, you can kind of scale. Um, not everybody has a super fast computer, um, so there are ways that you can kind of scale your experience to adjust to that. Um, network, um, bandwidth, and latency, so um, this is something we see, you know, if you're on, even here at MIT, the conference Wi-Fi is always, you know, we get a lot of people on board, it's maybe not going to be as super fast as we'd like, um, but you can be even worse if you're traveling on a train, you know, in your phone through a tunnel. Um, these are things that we need to kind of be aware of. That I think uh, a lot of kind of native platform uh, or non-web uh, engineers kind of take for granted, and designers as well. There's also the human responsive factors, which I think we don't really think about enough. Um, what's your level? What's your audience's level of education? Uh, what language do they speak? Um, you know, the web has a tradition of localization where you can kind of detect the user's language and switch up, you know, whether it's an audio track or some text. Um, what are their physical abilities? What's their level of wealth and income? And attention is also one. I mean, I think we like to assume that people have 
tons of time to view your experience and no distractions, but that's not really realistic. Um, so I think it's interesting to adjust. When we uh, talk about things like loading very quickly, I think that uh, pays respect to the audience and their level of attention. Um, so the web adapts to these things with um, what we call graceful de de uh, degradation. Um, and, and some of these things are you, you kind of do the best you can to detect what is the scenario that your user is in and adjust the content to fit it accordingly. Um, so with the web, because it's built into the web's culture and the web's technology, that becomes easier to do. And I think we don't really see these things in a lot of VR content. Um, VR con native VR makes some assumptions that I think are broken um, along these lines. So one of them is a fast, reliable network. Um, again, networks go down, even, even a great, you know, if you have fiber, like sometimes it goes down, or maybe you just, you live in some place that doesn't really have access to super fast uh, networking. Um, it assumes that your content is downloaded and installed in advance. Um, furniture is a big one. Um, sometimes you have these experiences where you're expected to turn around and look behind you, but maybe you're sitting on a couch. Um, I leave it to you guys to imagine what that looks like for somebody to turn around fully 180 degrees while they're sitting on a couch. Um, it's awkward and painful. Um, this is one that we experienced in New York uh, as a problem with uh, dedicated VR real estate. Um, we would like to get an HTC Vive at our office, but our office space is about that big, including, you know, for four chairs. So the, the, the real estate space is a bigger problem. Um, also, you know, distractions, et, et cetera. So there's some design implications of this. Um, you know, even, even the best scenarios, they, they, they break, right? Like, so we, what we do is, my, my team, we design for kind of the worst case scenario or the lowest common denominator and scale up from there. And what we find is that if you do that, the best case scenario becomes that much better. Uh, if I can build something that renders at 60 frames per second on an iPhone 5 or a cheap Android phone, when I get it on my, you know, desktop back at the office, my $1,500 GeForce 980 with the Oculus Rift, it's going to be even better. Um, and it's going to load up super fast. It just kind of, everybody wins when you kind of take, take on the discipline of designing for those uh, experiences. Um, so I'm going to run um, through this really fast. Uh, here's a very quick example. You guys can go to this. I'll tweet the URL in a little bit. Um, this is an adaptive example. Uh, it will play. This is just VR running in an iframe in my presentation loaded on the web. Um, these are the requisite trains that we all need to have in our presentation. I think that was a requirement. Um, <laughs> This is another quick example. I think we're going to show this outside. Um, this is really cool. So this is um, this is some BB-8 fan art. Uh, he should be, you know, I'll just click here and see if he shows up. There he is. Um, so this is really cool. I love this because, um, so this is 2.6 megabytes, the whole thing. Um, and the way this works is that the, the landscape, there's your 3D audio. Um, and this, again, works on Oculus, you know, cardboard, all these things. The landscape loads um, and the sky loads, they're procedural. So they load really, really fast. The BB-8 model is a few megabytes, and he takes three or four seconds. Thank you. Um, so what we do is we jump you right into the scene with the very, very light over the network landscape and sky. And then BB-8 will continue to load for a few more seconds. And whatever direction you're looking in, he appears over the horizon at that point. Um, so the experience itself is very adaptable. It's not necessarily linear. Um, and it adapts to what are your networking conditions, where are you looking. So these are the kind of principles that we're taking into account as we develop these web-based uh, VR experiences, which is a little bit, there are some different, it's a different thing to design than kind of the assumptions of you're in some kind of exhibit and you've, you know, have somebody else putting the vibe on your head and they're watching to make sure you don't trip and things like that. But it works in those uh, scenarios as well. I want to talk about inclusion because this came up during the panel and this is super important to me. Um, so I want to try to emphasize this. Um, the web VR tools are available. They're, yes, you can spend money on it. You can spend time on it. You can use technical expertise. The minimal cost of creation is about $150 for um, a cheap Android phone. You can take that Android phone and a cheap Google Cardboard for a few bucks. Um, you can go into a, a, a public library, sit down at Wi-Fi, because I don't assume that everybody has access to fiber, you know, internet in their house. Um, you can use a free hosting tool, and there are a few tools. A WebVR Starter Kit is something I built at POV last year. A-Frame is something that Mozilla is building right now. Um, these tools are available today. Right now, it runs on your cardboard. It will run on Oculus and Vive. 
there are no excuses. There's no hard drives, there's no camera rigs, nothing is expensive. Um, so no excuses, please. Um, currently this is available, Fi uh, Firefox and Chrome have experimental builds that will support the desktop um, headsets. Uh, Gear VR has an experimental build in their browser um, and it's available for cardboard today, iPhone, Android, et cetera. Um, I'm running out of time, but uh, we'll be we'll seeing we're, we expect to see release in the stable browsers by the end of this year. Um, we'll be looking at in the future uh, WebGL2 will improve uh, kind of the graphics capabilities, and you know we have a community of WebVR developers and creators that are continuing to improve uh, kind of what is the experience like. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. Um, please come talk to me later. Cool.